Okay, so our talk is Jenny Wilson, who will tell us uh, will tell us about the high degree rational cohomology of the special linear groups. Wonderful. Can can everyone hear me? Yep. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Um, in terms of technical stuff, my plan is to give the talk using a Jamboard, which is partially filled in. Um, I've, I'm sharing the link in case anybody's interested in, in looking at the actual Jamboard. This means you'll have the freedom to like scroll back to see previous slides. Um, I also, uh, to be optimally complicated, I'm sharing my screen, which has the Jamboard open, but not the same screen I'm using to write on it because uh, I've found it gets quite fritzy when I try to share that screen. So please yell at me if I forget to advance the slide that I'm sharing. I will, I will try to remember. Um, excellent. So on that note, I can begin. And as advertised, I am giving a talk about the, uh, the high degree rational cohomology of the special linear group. Oh, and my camera's a little wobbly. Let's see if we can fix that. Okay, great. So in this talk, I will be uh, describing some work that is joint with various subsets of these authors, um, Brooke, Coopers, Miller, Patz, Stroka, and Yasaki. And um, for the duration of the talk, I would like to uh, fix some notation. So throughout the talk, I'm going to use F to mean a number field, by which I mean a, a finite field extension, finite degree field extension of the rational numbers. And um, R is going to be the ring of integers inside the field F. So uh, if you're uh, for, uh, you know, I'm a topologist. So when I hear these words, I just think of examples like the following. So maybe our, the most important example for us might be uh, Z is the ring of integers inside the rational numbers or the Gaussian integers inside Q adjoin I. Um, here's another example. If I if I take Z and adjoin one half uh, the quantity one plus the square root of negative three, then that's the ring of integers inside this quadratic field extension. Um, great. Okay, so that's R and F fixed for the duration of the talk. And excellent. So I'm interested in studying the cohomology of the special linear group with entries in R um, and, and rational coefficients. And the first uh, comment to make is that the virtual cohomological dimension of these groups are known. They were, they were computed by Borel and Serre. And so what this means is this gives us uh, a lower bound on the um, uh, on the vanishing of these of these groups, this tells us uh, for formal reasons. Here it's um, let me say it's a result that this this virtual cohomological dimension grows like n squared, um, and for formal reasons, these cohomology groups have to be zero when Q is larger than the VCD. Okay, so right again, I, I there's there's a nice formula for the VCD. I won't write it down, but the key point is that it somehow depends on uh, the Galois theory of this of this finite field extension, and it grows like n squared. Okay, so we have vanishing outside of this range, and the next result that I wanted to uh, mention is a classical work of Borel on stability for these special linear groups. So if we consider the maps from SLN R to SLN plus one of R given by, well, let's say this, this kind of upper block embedding. Oops. Then these maps, these maps induce isomorphisms on cohomology once n is large compared to q. And so there's a, a known stable range, linear stable range for 
this um, these isomorphisms. And what that means is that right beneath this range, we have stability. The stable groups are known. OK. And so for this project, the project I'm going to describe today, instead, the goal is to understand the cohomology groups, the rational cohomology groups, when Q is really large relative to N. So Borel, his work answers the question for the case when N is really large relative to Q. And today I'm gonna to talk about the question of what we can say in the case that Q is instead close to the VCD. Okay. All right, so again, going back to if the, the definition of the VCD tells us that there is some twisted coefficient system, there's some rational in our representation, so that if I take coefficients in that rational representation, then it will be, the, these cohomology groups will be non-zero in the VCD. Knowing that this is the VCD, this computation of the VCD does not tell me whether or not these particular groups are zero or not when Q is equal to the VCD. And so this suggests what I consider a fairly fundamental question, um, which is the, the question, um, which is open even in the case when R is the integers, uh, the question of what is the largest degree, the largest degree Q, so that these groups are non-zero. Okay. And maybe uh, there's also the motivating meta question of how does the answer to this first question depend on the ring theory of R? Okay, so these questions are somehow the motivation for the, the program that I'm going to talk about in this talk today. Um, and uh, much of the work in this project is, is motivated by this conjecture of Church, Farb, and Putman in the case when R is the integers. So if in the case that we're looking at SLN Z, they uh, gave this uh, conjectural dual stability result, which is that if we look at the cohomology i degrees below the virtual cohomological dimension, so in other words, if we look at the cohomology in, in, in co-dimension i, then they conjecture that we get vanishing once i um, or for, for, I'm sorry, I less than N minus one. Okay, so they, in other words, they conjecture vanishing once N is large compared to I. Okay. So I'm going to advance a slide and summarize some of the known results so far on this program. So the first, the first result is um, due to Lee and Sharba in the case that R is a Euclidean ring. So for example, like the integers or the Gaussian integers. In this case, we have vanishing of these homology groups in the VCD. 
once n is at least two. And more recently, Church, Farb, and Putman showed that if we consider the case that R is not a PID, so you can have in mind rings like Z adjoin the square root of negative five, then in this case, we have non-vanishing of these top degree cohomology groups. And in fact, they gave lower bounds on the dimensions of these cohomology groups in terms of the class number of the ring R. So somehow the ring theory of R really is playing a role here. And so this leaves open the case uh, that we consider a ring R that is a PID, but, but not Euclidean. And um, in, in joint work with Miller, Potts, and Yastrowski, we proved, well, we partially answered this question for the list of quadratic field extensions here, we showed that we have non-vanishing in the top degree for even values of n. Okay, this, this question, it's open for odd values of n. A and a comment, if you, if you assume the generalized Riemann, oh, is there a question? Maybe not. If you assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis, then Weinberger proved under, under that assumption that the only ring R um, not accounted for by these three results is the, is the case that R is the ring of integers in, in Q would join the square root of negative 19. So, uh, right, this, this case, is also still open. Okay. So let's see here. So in particular, in the case in the case um, that we look at R equals Z, this is a, a proof of the Churchfarb, um, the Churchfarb Putman conjectures uh, for co-dimension zero. Uh, Church and Putman also proved that their conjecture holds in co-dimension one. So they proved that in the case that R equals Z, if we look one degree below the VCD, then we have vanishing of these co-dimension one cohomology groups. Okay. And uh, in joint work with Coopers, Miller, and Potts, we proved that if R is the Gaussian or Eisenstein integers, we also have vanishing for, um, for N at least three. All right. But uh, notably, we are this the proof we used um, for this result, which was an adaptation in a sense of, of the Church Pumpman approach. Uh, it, it showed, um, I mean, provably this approach does not work for all rings R, and it does not even work for all Euclidean rings R. And so uh, it's not totally clear, I think, what properties of R are, are driving this result. And this this question about what happens in co-dimension one is, is quite open. Okay. In the case of um, co-dimension two, there is work in progress uh, joint with Brook, Miller's Putz, uh, and Sroka to show that we get vanishing here as well. So this establishes the, um, the church our Putman conjectures in the co-dimension two case. And I'll mention that again at the very end. Okay, so that's a list of, of known results to this question. And um, certainly one takeaway is that there's quite a lot that we still don't know. Let me talk a little bit about 
how one might think about this problem. Um, and in particular, I hope I, uh, in over the course of this talk to give a proof of this case, of the case that R is Euclidean, explain how we can prove that we get vanishing of this top degree group um, and how we can do this by understanding the topology of a certain simplicial complex. So that's, that's the main goal for today's talk. Okay. Great, so the, the key to approaching this whole program is the idea of virtual Biary-Ekman duality. Um, so here's some uh, foundational results that- um, Jenny? Yeah? There's a question in the chat. There's what are the Eisenstein in the integers? Oh, I'm sorry, that's right. So the Eisenstein integers are what we, we get by taking the, um, the ring of integers in uh, zeta join the square root of negative three. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Good question. Um, excellent. So, right. So back to this idea of virtual Bieri Ekman duality. If we embed, um, or rather, we can embed SLNR as a lattice inside uh, a group I'll call G, which is some made of some number of copies of SLNR and some number of copies of SLNC. And then we can define the uh, symmetric space associated to SLNR as the quotient of G by a maximal compact subgroup. And it's, it's, a, uh, it's a fact that um, this, this symmetric space is contractible. So uh, a, a, a example which may be familiar to some is the case of SL2Z. So in that case, the, the associated symmetric space is um, SL2R mod compact subgroup SO2, which we can identify with the hyperbolic plane by considering the map that takes a matrix ABCD to the complex number, oh, maybe I want to do A plus IB over C plus ID and running an orbit stabilizer argument, okay. And so, Great. Okay, so here's a picture of my hyperbolic plane and a picture of a fundamental domain for the action of SL2Z on, on the hyperbolic plane. Okay, so a reminder in general for, um, for our general R and N, we get, we get an action on the symmetric space X, which is um, right defined as this quotient space. And uh, right, so I guess, you know, I, I'm a topologist. So if I want to understand the cohomology of a group, well, what do I do? I want to get my group acting on a space and uh, ideally a contractible space. Um, and I hope that that action is properly discontinuous. And I hope that that action is free. And I'm really happy if I have a properly discontinuous free action on a contractible space and the quotient has the topology of a compact manifold because then I have a very nice k-pi-1 space I can use to, um, to, to study the cohomology of my group. Um, and unfortunately, in, in this case, we do not get all of those things. So, so some good news and bad news about the setup that we have here. Um, good news is that well, the space X, the symmetric space is a smooth manifold. And the action is properly discontinuous. Okay. 
Um, but some bad news, well, the, the first piece of bad news is that the action is not free. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, this is not a covering space action. I'm not going to get um, be able to get a classifying space as by taking the quotient um, for SLNR. But the good news is that the stabilizers are finite. And so that means that the quotient will be sufficient to compute the rational homology and cohomology of my group. So the good news is that if I'm interested in the cohomology with rational coefficients that will be equal to the cohomology of this quotient. Okay. And uh, some more bad news is that the action is not co-compact. Okay, so it's it's just not the case that SLNR has the cohomology of a compact manifold. Um, but some good news is that we can um, we can compactify the quotient. I'm sorry, it doesn't have the cohomology of a closed manifold. Okay, so in, in this case that we're studying of, um, let's, let's look back at, at this picture we have in the case of SL2Z acting on the hyperbolic plane, right? So we have, we have our fundamental domain, um, which, is, which is finite volume, um, but unfortunately it, it has this cusp here going off to infinity. And so in order to right, uh, in order to compactify the quotient, I want to add, first of all, I'm going to add uh, a point at infinity. And then add its orbit under SL2Z. So I'm going to add a point at a point at P over Q for each each rational point. And I want, um, I want these new points, these new points have the discrete topology. Okay. And so, so uh, right, the good news is that after, with the properties that, um, first of all, the bordification is a manifold with corners. Manifold with like the extra data of a, of a stratification on it. Um, it is still contractible. Okay, and now the quotient is compact. Okay, and the boundary of this bordified symmetric space is the Tietz buildings associated to SLNR. Okay. In fact, associated to it, maybe it's easier to define if we remember um, this this ambient field F, which is the field of fractions of R. Okay, so we can view this Tietz building as a simplicial complex, where the vertices 
correspond to proper non-zero subspaces V in Fn. And the simplices correspond to flags of subspaces. So I get a simplex for each flag. All right. And it's a result of Solomon and Teats that these, these Teats buildings are homotopy equivalent to a wedge of infinitely many spheres of dimension n minus two. And so this is, I think, great news because it follows um, from the Solomon Teats building and from an appropriate version of Poincare duality, that we get the following duality theorem. So it follows that the co dimension I cohomology of SLNR with rational coefficients is isomorphic to the degree I. Um, homology of SLNR with coefficients in the following SLNR representation, where here this, this representation, STNF, is the single non-vanishing homology group of the Teach building. Okay, so again, the upshot of, of this entire um, storyline is that in order to study this co-dimension I, so in order to study the, the high degree cohomology of these special linear groups with rational coefficients, we can instead study the low degree homology of the special linear group um, at the expense of now working with these twisted coefficients. And this, right, by, by again, the appropriate version of Poincaré duality, this, this twisted coefficients module comes from um, the, the boundary of our fortified symmetric spaces. So this is the single non-vanishing reduced homology group of these Teats buildings. All right, so I'm going to advance a slide. Okay. And so again, to summarize, I guess the technical terms for all of this is that SLNR is a so-called virtual duality group. And definition, this group here, it's the degree n minus two reduced homology of the Teats building. Okay. And again, a reminder what this tells us that in order to compute these homology groups, we can instead compute, sorry, to compute these cohomology groups, we can compute the following homology groups. And we can now do this as follows. So one way to compute these groups is to construct a resolution of our rationalized Steinberg module by flat SLNR rational representations. Uh, we then, so, okay, so here's my, here's my flat resolution. If we then drop this last term and take SLNR covariance, and by covariance, a reminder, I mean, I'm, I want to mod out by the action of SLNR. So I, I pass to the largest quotient for SLNR acts trivially. Okay, that gives me this new chain complex. And um, the, the homology of this chain complex is going to be these homology groups of SLNR with these twisted coefficients. So 
what this means is if our goal is to compute these groups, then what our goal becomes is we want to be able to compute, we, we want to construct a nice resolution of the Steinberg module where by a nice resolution, I mean a flat resolution where we have um, a hope of being able to compute these covariants. Okay. And the key to doing this is going to be to understand somehow the topology of this teach building. So maybe I should pause and see if there are any questions up to this point. All right. Um, so something I, I want to uh, do with the rest of the talk is to explain how we could prove this, this result um, originally due to Lee and Sharba that if we consider the case that R is a Euclidean ring, then we get vanishing of SL and R of its, of its cohomology in the top degree. And to that end, so first observe that our uh, virtual beery ekman duality statement um, specializes to the statement that we can identify the top degree cohomology group with the degree zero homology of SLNR with coefficients in our Steinberg module. And that is going to be the covariance of the Steinberg module. So, right, to prove that we get vanishing of this top degree cohomology group, um, it certainly suffices to show uh, that we can find a generating set for this Steinberg module that vanishes in the covariance by, by SLNR. Okay. So let's, let's think about what this means. Um, first, in, in the case that n equals 2. In the case that n equals 2, then our Tietz building is, by definition, just the set of lines in the field F2. This, this is a discrete set. Okay. And so in this case, our, um, our Steinberg module is going to be um, the reduced homology in degree zero, which is now going to be given by formal differences in these formal elements that correspond to lines in F2. All right, so let's, let's think about 
how uh, SL2Z, or we'll, we'll specialize to the case that R equals Z, and let's think about this action and think about what we would need in order to prove uh, vanishing of the SL2Z covariance for this space. So let's consider first um, the generator that corresponds to our favorite lines, the lines that come from the standard basis. Okay. So I claim that it is not difficult to check that this um, this particular element in this zero with reduced homology group vanishes under the action of SL2Z. Okay. And I, I claim that one way we can see this is if we consider the following matrix, then this matrix is going to negate this element. So, right, so let's check that. If, uh, if I look at this line and I act on it by this matrix, well, it maps it to this line. And if I act on this line, it, it um, maps it to, well, the negation. Uh, I, so it maps it uh, to this line, even though I've, I've negated the, the basis element, but that's fine because that doesn't change which line, which line it is. Um, I, I need this negative one here to make sure that I actually got a matrix with determinant positive one. Um, great, and so the upshot is that the action of this matrix negates this element. And so this element X vanishes in covariance. okay. So that's promising. So far, it looks like, based on this one example, it looks like it's going to be easy to check that these covariants vanish under the action of SL2Z. But unfortunately, if instead we look at the second line, now let's consider the second line Q, uh, the, the span of one zero minus the span of two one. So this is, um, I'm sorry, this the second, not a line, this is an element in this Steinberg module. Then unfortunately the same trick just won't work in this case. So I claim that there does not exist any element G in SL2Z that negates this element. Okay, so that, that's an exercise that I think the, the audience could, could carry out if you, were, if you were so inclined. But morally, the, the reason that this doesn't, uh, that there's no such G is that these two spanning vectors I chose uh, is not a basis for Z2. So these, these two elements span a subgroup that is index two in Z2. They're not a basis for Z2. And that's a problem. So now all of a sudden it's not so obvious whether or not the image of this basis element is going to be zero in covariance. Okay. So I can give you a spoiler, it is zero. So we, uh, Lee and Charba prove that these groups do vanish, these cohomology groups. Um, and a way that we can address this problem is to find a smaller generating set for the Steinberg module. Okay, so a little bit of background on the topology of these Teats buildings to that end. And let me let me advance to slide number five. So remember, um, a, a reminder that our, our Teats building, this is um, the, the simplicial complex whose simplices correspond to flags of proper uh, non-zero subspaces of Fn, okay? And 
here's a definition given a frame, given a frame for Fn, a frame means a, a decomposition as a sum of lines, then we can define a subcomplex of the Teats building, which uh, I'll denote by S of this frame. This is this is the full subcomplex, the full subcomplex on vertices corresponding to uh, direct sums. of any collection of, of um, like any proper subset of these LIs. Okay. And this, this subcomplex is called an apartment. Okay. And it's a fact that's not too hard to check that these apartments are homeomorphic to spheres. So let's let's draw a picture in the case um, in the case n equals three. You have a picture in mind like the following. Here's a picture of a a apartment inside my Teats building. Um, given a given a frame L one, L two, and L three. We get uh, the the full subcomplex on all uh, spans of non-zero proper subsets of this frame is the following uh, triangle, and um, in general, you can check that one of these apartments is going to be um, uh, simplicially isomorphic to the the very centric subdivision of the uh, boundary of an n minus one simplex. So in particular, they're going to be spheres. Okay, and, and uh, Solomon and Teat's result, uh, their, their work implies that our Steinberg module is, is generated by apartment classes. So it's generated by the images of these of these apartments. Okay. And so the key to uh, to this result of Lee and Sharba, the key to showing that SLNR, when R is Euclidean, has vanishing cohomology in its top degree, is the following. It's that um, it's back. In fact, let me let me scroll back a slide for just a second. So, what this um, what we saw over here, what what the Solomon Teach result showed, is the analog of this generating set that somehow we're generated by our, our Steinberg module is generated by these spheres that come from frames for um, the uh, for F n. And what we really want, what we really want is not just generation by um, uh, collections of um, lines that come from all frames. We really want to have generation by what are called um, integral frames, which come from bases, not just of Fn, but from bases of, of Rn. So in the case of the integers, I want, I want to be generated not just from things that come from bases for q to the n, but I want generation by elements that come from a basis of z to the n. And as long as that's the case, we can run this trick, and then we get vanishing of covariance very easily. And that's exactly what Lee, uh, sorry, what Ash and Rudolph proved. This is a bit anachronous because Ash and Rudolph's result came later than Lee and Sharpa. But um, it's one way to, to prove it. They showed that 
the Steinberg module is generated by integral apartment classes Um, i.e., these are classes um, associated to apartments where each line is the span of some vector v sub i, um, and the vectors v1 up to vn are a basis for r to the n. Okay, so they're a basis, they're an integral basis and not just a basis when I pass to the field of fractions. Okay, and the claim is that this result, this, this result implies vanishing of, in the case when R is Euclidean, of the top degree cohomology of SLNR. Okay. okay, so let's let's review why that is. Again, we can identify the top degree cohomology of SLNR with the co-invariance of my Steinberg module, which is which is exactly these cohomology groups, these homology groups, pardon me, here, with um, the covariance of these homology classes. Okay. And so it will be enough to prove vanishing of these covariants. It will be enough to prove that our generating set vanishes when we take covariance. And now we know we're generated by these integral apartment classes. So if I take an integral frame corresponding to a basis of Rn, then we can write down the following matrix in SLNR. Where this, this matrix is uh, written with respect to this integral basis. And you can check, you can check that this matrix will stabilize this apartment, it will stabilize the sphere, and it will act on the sphere by an orientation reversing map. Okay, since, since G acts on this set of lines by an odd permutation. All right, so for this picture we've drawn here, this matrix G is going to act by a reflection, uh, probably this reflection. And so it's going to negate this class in homology. All right, and so that implies in the top degree. Oh, uh, and I, I just got a notification that my internet is unstable. Am I still audible? We just had a, a there were like a couple seconds where you uh, muted out, but we're seem, it seems to be going pretty well. So I wouldn't worry about it for now. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, so again, to summarize, the key is to proving this result, top the uh, vanishing of SLNR cohomology in its top degree. The key to proving this result was the fact that the um, top degree homology of our Tietz building 
is generated by spheres like this one that arise from a basis for R to the N. Okay. Great, so let me advance by a slide. Um, I'll remark that in joint work with um, Miller, Potts, and Yasaki, we studied um, the, the question of what happens when R is a PID, but not Euclidean. And specifically, we looked at these four quadratic field extensions, which uh, if you believe the generalized Riemann hypothesis, give us all number rings with that property. Um, and we proved in that case that the Steinberg module the Steinberg modules associated to this list of rings, they are not generated by integral apartment classes. Okay. Which means that unfortunately, the, the approach from the previous slide to proving that these uh, cohomology groups are non-vanishing in their top degree, it won't work. Um, and in fact, we showed that we got we get non-vanishing in the case of three of the rings that for at least some values of n. And it's, it's open for negative 19. So we do not know whether or not um, the uh, ring of integers inside this, uh, this quadratic field extension uh, whether whether the corresponding rings SL and R um, have cohomology that vanishes in the top degree. That's unknown. Okay. So I wanted to, I guess in the last few minutes of the talk, just go quickly over the next step, which is the co-dimension one cohomology for these groups. So to study the co-dimension zero cohomology, this was a matter of understanding generators for the Steinberg module. And correspondingly, to just understand the co-dimension one cohomology, we need to understand presentations for the Steinberg modules. Since, as you recall, that if we have a presentation or rather a partial um, flat resolution of the Steinberg module, then if we take co-invariance of these terms, then Right in degree zero, the homology at this point in the chain complex is going to give us the top degree homology with rational coefficients. And the homology here is going to give us the co-dimension one homology, uh, cohomology, pardon me, of the of SLNR. And so if we, again, if we have a nice presentation for the Steinberg module, then that will allow us to compute this co-dimension one cohomology. And now maybe we can say more about what I might mean by nice, since we saw in the previous example that I really want somehow my the terms in this resolution to be generated by things that look like bases for r to the n and not just bases for f to the n okay so there's a result of bykovsky that was um, a presentation for the steinberg module in the case that r is the integers and this was um, recently, uh, a new proof was given by Church and Putman of this presentation. And the presentation is as follows. So the, the generators, again, are going to be our integral apartment classes, um, which I'm now going to represent by a, a list of vectors in, in Z to the N that are a, a basis for Z to the N. And they show that you get a presentation if we if um, we take the following relations. So I've written it out here, but the relations give me a relation between um, my uh, apartment class corresponding to the basis V1 through Vn 
and the basis for V1, V1 plus V2, V3, and so forth up to Vn. And the apartment class corresponding to V1 plus V2, V2, V3, et cetera, up to Vn. Okay. And so it, it's an exercise that, again, is not much harder than the calculation we did on the previous slide. It's an exercise to show that if we use this presentation, we, we, we get a flat partial resolution of SLNZ and that the covariants vanish in, in degree one. And so this implies This implies vanishing of our co-dimension one cohomology groups. Um, at least, probably, I need and at least three here. Great. And there's work in progress, joint with um, Brooke Miller, Potts, and oops, uh, Robin Stroka. Sorry, that. Um, we can extend this resolution or we can make a new resolution that is even one step further um, where, again, somehow the terms are get, arise from generators that are not precisely bases corresponding to bases of, of um, ZN, but are fairly close. And they're close enough that we can more or less use the same trick from the previous slide to show that the covariants vanish. And this implies the next step of this church bar putman conjecture, which is that we get vanishing of these uh, co-dimension two cohomology groups once n is at least four. All right, and, and that concludes my talk. So thank you very much. Okay, let's first of all, we'll thank her. And we have a few minutes for questions if people have them. Okay, last call for questions. So I see a oh, question there is one in, the in, the, in the comments, which says, what hope is there for these techniques and Zmod P coefficients? And I don't know if I have a great answer to that question, but um, I, I can say that if I, let me, let me go back a few slides. Unfortunately, the whole setup breaks down. If I go back to this page here, the whole um, the whole setup breaks down if p is um, is not co prime to the order of the torsion um, in in this action of SLNR on the symmetric spaces, then um, the, the, then the quotient in this picture does not compute the the cohomology of SLN. R with, with FP coefficients. And so unfortunately, um, as far as I know, all the tools that I've mentioned here just don't apply in that case. So it's not, it's not clear to me that then studying the Teats building um, would, would have any bearing on, on those cohomology groups, unfortunately. Right. Um, there, I don't know, there, there, I'm sure there are people who can give more nuanced answers to this question. Uh, I had hoped there might be enough structure there that you'd have non-zero results, but you could do something with it. But yeah, it's, that would be a pipe dream. <laughs> no, non-zero results for the rational cohomology or for FP or? Yeah, yeah. That, that, I mean, you might be able to say enough about the quotient despite the fact that it, um, um, there's non-zero cohomology there. That's, uh, that, no, anyway. Yeah, I, think, I, I think didn't really think it would work. I think you'd expect that there'd be sort of cohomology in arbitrarily high dimensions once you have um, torsion in your group that 
mm -hmm. um, provides the torsion of the coefficients mm -hmm. or the coefficients. So that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Matthew. Sure. Other um, questions? I did have a question. I just yeah. uh, find it. Um, so it's a little surprising to me, I guess, that um, <laughs> for the non Euclidean PIDs, um, that the one that's unknown is uh, Q adjoint root negative 19. I, I don't know. It, it just like fe feels like it's a smaller ring, right? <laughs> um, this, so, so sort of, is there like something that breaks down or? Oh yeah. So the, the key to our non-vanishing results in that case came from, um, we like looked up known computations, I think due to Voteman in the uh -huh. case when n equals two. So the, the um, uh, for SL2z, there, there were explicit calculations of these, of, of these top degree cohomology groups, and uh -huh. they were non-vanishing for, for those three rings that did not come from negative 19. And so somehow we could run that, we could plug this into some spectral sequence and bootstrap from there a non-vanishing result in higher degrees. Um, fortunately or unfortunately or whatever, in the case of negative 19, for n equals two, that top group did vanish. And so we couldn't, we couldn't run our argument in that case. I see. So that's right. That, that's why there is that discrepancy. And I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what to think no. to expect yeah. in, in that case. Cool. Um, Other questions? Okay, if not, we will, we can thank Jenny uh, one more time for her talk and we will wrap it up here for 